seven o'clock. So <clears throat> I am going to um, call the select board meeting of November 19th, 2024 to order. Um, we actually don't have a shout out and recognition on this agenda. So I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege before I start all the other announcements um, to um, give a shout out to the Bourne um, High School Girls Volleyball team who won their game last Friday to become the Division Five State Championships. Mm -hmm. and I'm very excited. We worked hard. Um, they did work hard. Um, I also um, want to just take a moment to recognize Barry Pat Flynn, who passed away last week at the age of 90. Um, she was a longtime uh, select board member in Falmouth and a county commissioner for many years. So uh, just to thank her for her years of service. Uh, so note this meeting is being televised, streamed, or recorded by Board TV. If anyone in the audience is recording or videotaping, they need to acknowledge at this time. Jamie? Hi, it's Jamie. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, use of flash photography during select board meetings is prohibited. Um, we have select board members, Melissa Ferretti and Louise Rooney and Peter Meyer and myself here at the meeting, and Gina Zarevitz is on Zoom from the select board. If anyone wishes to uh, <clears throat> access the meeting, they can do so by calling the following conference line, 1929-205-6099. The Zoom meeting ID is 869-5775-5505. And the password is uppercase, born, B-O-U-R-N-E. The Zoom chat will not be monitored. Participants who wish to speak must raise the hand icon until the chair asks them to unmute. Um, before we go in the joint meeting, I'm going to... Um, do two select board um, items, uh, um, three and four from the agenda. <laughs> item three is uh, public comment on non-agenda items. Is there anyone here um, or on Zoom with a public comment on non-agenda items? So I saw Jack, you, would you like to introduce yourself and then I'll give your instructions? <clears throat> yes, I'm, I'm uh, Jack Madero. Okay. So public comments are allowed to up for a total of 12 minutes at the beginning of each meeting. Each speaker is limited to three minutes for comment. Board members are unable to respond due to posting um, requirements of the open meeting law. So you may speak, but we will not respond to your um, comments. You may go ahead. Okay. So uh, my wife and I have been uh, longtime visitors to Bourne vacations and recently purchased a home here with the intention of moving to the town uh, full-time. Uh, we were excited to find that the that our 650 square foot cottage we bought had an upgraded septic system capable of supporting a third bedroom and a second bathroom, uh, features that would make the home suitable for our family. However, when we met with an architect to begin planning our renovation, we were informed that the property is located in a newly designated nitrogen sensitive area. <laughs> We were told that, <clears throat> excuse me, due to these regulations, we cannot proceed with any renovations unless we upgrade the septic. Um, after seeking uh, quotes from contractors, we found that the cost of this upgrade would, would range between thirty and fifty thousand dollars, and that will likely consume a large portion of our budget, possibly derailing our plans to move into the home. Um, as we continue to research the new NSA regulations, we discovered that some towns in the area have filed a notice of intent with the state to have these regulations suspended or modified. Um, this week, we we noticed a proposed MEPA or Mass Environmental Policy Act application posted on the town born website. Um, and we were pleased to hear that the town plans to address the issue. However, we were concerned to learn that the current plan is to wait until after the May town meeting to file the NOI. Um, so we strongly urge the select board to reconsider this timeline and file the NOI sooner as it would greatly benefit homeowners like us who are anxiously awaiting a resolution to this. Thank you very much. Your comments. Uh, next is uh, an agenda item number four, uh, consent agenda uh, appointment of Denise Young to the council and aging term to expire on June 30th, 2027. 
Um, Denise is here. Um, you're not required to speak, but you may, if you'd like to. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to. Can I, see? I think everybody can hear. We don't need that. Is, Go ahead. Can I sit? Can I stand? Yeah, you can sit right there. Okay. Hi, my name is Denise Young. Um, I've lived in Sagamore Beach for five years. Um, I'm a retired elementary teacher who taught in Melrose and Natick for 30 years. I lived in Natick for 43 years before moving to Sagamore Beach and was very active in the community, teaching in the town and raising my two children. When I retired, I was active in many volunteer activities. When I moved to Sagamore Beach, I was also interested in volunteering my time to become an active member of the community. I'm now a volunteer at the Happy Hope Factory. I'm a member of the Born Women's Club and Born Newcomers and Neighbors. I've also participated in fitness and craft activities at the community center. I'm also the president of the Dave Young Children's Literature Foundation. This is a nonprofit foundation that contributes funds to school libraries and provides scholarships to graduating high school seniors. I feel that serving on the Council of Aging is a very valuable opportunity to make a meaningful contribution to the local senior population by shaping programs and services. I would be thrilled to serve on the Council of Aging. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's some, is there a motion? We'll appoint Denise Young to the Council on Aging for a term to expire on June 30th, 2027. Second. Motion by Anne-Marie, second by Melissa. Is there any discussion? Consent. So, okay. Um, with um, Jean on Zoom, this has to be a roll call vote. So, Jean, yes. Melissa, yes. Yeah. Marie, yes. Peter, yes. MJ, yes. And if you all just um, bear with me, um, uh, um, uh, is there someone here from Dunkin' for Dunkin' Donuts? I am. I'm sorry, I'm on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, one <Long> picture. <laughs> um, okay. Um, um, my, my apologies, Madam Chair. I misread the agenda. I thought I could present by Zoom. I didn't realize I was supposed to be there in person. No, it's okay. It's fine. You want to introduce yourself? I mean, if Bear with me. I think this is going to be another couple minutes, and if we can just do this so that he doesn't have to take yeah, absolutely. I appreciate your uh, consideration. Uh, my name is attorney Christopher Corain. I am representing the applicant Cape Cod Enterprises, DBA, Dunkin Donuts, uh, uh, Dunkin and the applicant uh, owner, uh, Sal Quoto. Uh, this is basically the new the new uh, Dunkin Donuts that uh, was approved by the planning board that's going in at 568 MacArthur Boulevard. It's an application for a common victuallers license. Basically, this is the relocation from the existing um, location on Clay Pond Road. So obviously the board's familiar with Mr. Quoto and this, this Dunkin' Donuts, he also owns the one at the Rotary. Uh, it's your standard Dunkin' Donuts, your donuts, coffee, uh, warm sandwiches, things of that nature, your standard fare. Um, the operating hours would be 4 a.m. to um, 12 a.m. per the uh, application. Um, so again, you know, pretty straightforward. It's a, the new Duncan location at 568, replacing the, uh, the basically relocating from the uh, Clay Pond Road, Clay Pond Road location. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, I think everything's in order on the application. It is. Yeah. Any questions from the board? Is there a motion? Yes. Make a motion to approve the annual common ridiculous license for Cape Cod Enterprise LLC doing business as Duncan at. 568 Macapa Boulevard, as conditioned by department and pending final inspections. Second. Motion by Peter, second by Anne Marie. Is there any further discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, roll call vote. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Anne Marie? Yes. Peter? Yes. MJ votes yes. 500. Zero, zero. You are approved. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you for allowing me to do it by the Zoom. <laughs> Okay, so now we are um, going to um, the joint meeting. Um, do you want to call your meeting to order? All right, I'd like to call the Tuesday, November 19th, Born School Committee meeting to order. This meeting is a joint meeting with the Finance Committee, Born Public Schools, and Upper Cape Tech Superintendents and School Committees. Thank you. Uh, Jim, do you want to call your meeting to order? Yes, we'll call the Finance Committee meeting to order. Thank you. I don't think you have a quorum. I do not. 
<laughs> me. Okay, um, I think we should just quickly maybe go around and introduce each of you. So we have some new members since last year when we uh, when we did this again. So you want to start, Liz? Sure. Liz Hartsgrove, Assistant Town Administrator. Marlene McCollum, Town Administrator. Erica Fleming, Finance Director. Barry Schofield, School Committee. Emily Berry, School Committee Chair. Donnell Beals, School Committee Vice Chair. Kendallin Gagney, School Committee Member. Wayne Fuller, School Committee Member. Jordan Geist, Director of Business Services, Bourne Public Schools. Carrie Quinlan Joe, Superintendent, Bourne Public Schools. Mary Jane Mastrangelo, Chair, Board, School Committee, a uh, select board. <laughs> For a new job. Amory Sturmian, select board member. That's a very select board. Chair. Vice chair, sorry. <laughs> Harry Kwan, Wabinog chair, also. Jamie yeah. Zerowitz, the clerk, is on the Zoom. Dan Deegan, Finance Committee. Priscilla Harcourt, Finance Committee. Roger Borgett, Superintendent, Upper Cape Tech, trying to blend in with the FinCon. <laughs> Jim Sullivan, Chairman of the Finance Committee. Wayne Sampson, uh, Finance Committee. Tom Joyce, Finance Committee. Carla Emmons, Finance Committee Clerk. <laughs> um, okay, so turn it over to um, uh, for me, our discussion, fiscal year 2024 review and fiscal year 2026 budget preview and long-term planning. I turn it over to our town administrator. Thank you. So Erica is going to take us through the review first, and then we're going to talk about um, a new tool for long-term planning that the state has ruled out that I think many of you will find useful and interesting. <clears throat> this is very informal. So we're going, please, I want to encourage you to stop us along the way and ask questions. We want to take this opportunity to talk about what some of the terms and the and the definitions that we use, what this means as we go through building the budget and taking it to town meeting. So um, if there's something that you would like more information on or you're not clear about, please don't hesitate that we would like to have a conversation with you as we go over this material. And I'll turn it over to Erica. <laughs> Thank you, Harleen. Hi, everyone. So tonight we're going to start with the fiscal 24 financial review. So again, it's a special time of year. We're closing out fiscal 24. My pesky auditors were in last week. We're in fiscal 25 and we're planning for fiscal 26. So we'll do our best to keep our year straight tonight. And I always like to remind everyone, keep in mind that fiscal 24 was a budget that we started planning two years ago. So it's been a minute, right? So we'll start. Um, tonight with a review of the general fund financial results, financial policy compliance, other funds, and enterprise funds. Getting right into it. The general fund operating budget was approved at the May 1st, 2023 town meeting in the amount of $77,537,218. Subsequently, we amended the budget by $50,000 that was an increase to the police budget for uh, contractual agreements for dispatchers. And we also increased the budget $100,000 for some unanticipated special education costs. So we were able to utilize the special education reserve fund for that. And the revenue sources to support this budget include the tax levy of 60.3 million, state aid net of assessments, 3.28 million, Local receipts, $8.4 million. Other um, enterprise fund indirect costs, $2.5 million. Special revenue funds, $2.1. We utilize the capital stabilization fund, $1.1 million. And then there was an offset to the overlay reserve and some off budget items that balance the budget to the $77,687,218. So general fund revenue. This is really where every budget should begin, right? Like, so this is this determines how much we can spend. As a general rule of thumb, revenue should always be conservatively underestimated. That's direct guidance from the Department Division of Local Standards. Um, 
Revenues, again, are all monies received from any source by the town. The town of Born has three major sources of revenue. Our largest source of revenue is property taxes, makes up 74%. Local receipts, 15%. And state aid makes up 11%. From a financial perspective, property taxes being our largest source, it's a very stable revenue source and it's not subject to the volatility of the economy, but it does hit the taxpayers' pockets. Some of the elements, elements that make up property taxes include new growth. We always start with the levy limit. From the prior year, we add on 2.5% per proposition 2.5%. And then we add new growth. As you can see here in fiscal 24, we budgeted new growth to $400,000. We came on over target at $656,443. The other thing that we add to the tax levy is excluded debt. Excluded debt is action taken by the community via referendum vote to raise debt service for a particular project. So these are projects that were voted on at town meeting. This includes the DPW facility, the police building, the intermediate school, there's still a little piece of the elementary school hanging on. So that was $3,849,198 in fiscal 24. Oh, and I'm sorry, that was a fiscal 25 number. I'm looking ahead. But in fiscal 24, it was $3,994,396. So you'll see that starting to come down a little bit as we move into future years. Our next largest bucket of receipts are local receipts. Again, these are locally generated receipts. Our, major, ma our biggest source of local receipts are motor vehicle excise. Approximately, they make up approximately 31% of our local receipts. And then you'll see various excise taxes, boats, occupancy tax, mails tax, um, penalties and interest, recreation. A couple of the larger ones are the ice rim host community fee is shown as a local receipt, as well as our solar energy credits. You'll see in the current in fiscal 24 investment income came in well over the budgeted amount due to the change in the rates. And that one's we need to be careful of because rates can come down and that will change. So local receipts are generally um, indicative of how the economy is doing. So if things aren't doing so well, these tend to decrease. I ask a question about the occupancy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this is the hotel tax plus the short-term rental tax, right? Mm -hmm. we, have we been able to do some sort of breakdown? Is, so, is this increasing more because of the short-term rental or more because COVID is, we're coming off of COVID and we're starting to get more hotel revenue, do you know? I think it's more because of the short-term rental. I can request that data, it's not readily available, but if the, we can request it from the state um, and I can do yeah, that. I'm maybe. interested in that breakdown because when the short-term rental tax started, we really had no basis on which to do it. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that that's what they base the um, uh, wastewater, the Cape and Islands wastewater protection. So they have, they should have a good, easily available, good number for board. I was just curious about that. Good point. Thank you, MJ. Thank you. I have a quick question. Recreation is the largest line in there. What does that encompass? Those are all of the fees that the Department of Natural Resources charges. Um, part of that is even the gasoline that um, boats purchased. So we pay for it out of here and then we receive the income and we pay for it out of the budget. And then this is the income coming in. So all the fuel we sell at the marinas is included in there. That's a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> Marina fees and, and uh, you know. And that also, does that also includes all the beach stickers. Mm -hmm. And so all of those types of fees. Any other questions? Now we're moving on to state aid, and these are, again, just revenue allocated by the Commonwealth to the town. Again, it's 
not a large percentage of our bucket of our, of our of our budget, but it is noteworthy. And you'll see that we received nine million four hundred sixty four thousand two hundred forty seven dollars. And then there are a, there is a school choice and a library offset that are not general fund receipts. So really, the net amount to the general fund is eight million five hundred fifty eight thousand dollars. And most of the aid is chapter 70, which is education enrollment related. That takes us through our revenue sources. And now we'll move on to general fund appropriations, expenses and assessments. In fiscal 24, the budget of $77,687,218 did increase from the prior year by $3.6 million or 4.9%. At the end of the year, approximately 1.5 million or 2% of the budget was turned back to fund balance. This is something that turns back, that builds up our free cash in future years. So as you can see here are all of our expenditure categories. Um, and you can see what was close to fund balance in the column to the right there. And it really was a mixed bag. There isn't one department that's really not spending their budget. And it's generally because of some unanticipated um, staffing issues, et cetera. Visually, I like this slide a little bit better because you can see 39% of our costs, that's our largest portion, goes to education. That includes both one public schools and upper tech. The next bucket is shared costs. And those are all of our um, health insurance costs, liability insurance, our pension assessment, things of those nature. And utilities. And utilities. Utilities are a big one in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then public safety, debt service at 9%. Keep in mind that's both excluded and non-excluded debt. That's all the debt minus enterprise funds and so on. I'd like to just show you a recap of how the year ended. So the state revenue over and under the budget came in a little under with a deficit of $82,000. We killed it in local receipts. It came in at 3.4 over, 3.4 million over, and turn backs were 1.5 million. Um, turn backs, rule of thumb, should generally be 1% to 2% of your budget. And again, these are the things that will close out and build up free cash in future years. If I can, I just yeah. want to talk a little bit about um, the percentages that you're seeing there for the turnbacks. We are being very mindful um, that we try to be with that within that one to two percent for turnbacks. So we don't want to pad our budget up front and ask for more than we need. Um, and we also want to spend the money that were allocated to, to provide the services that people need. So I am, I am cognizant of the large turnbacks as a warning sign that either, you know, budgets are over padded at the beginning or that we're just, we're falling short on our service provision targets. And we're not actually doing what we said we would do with the funds. Here's just a history of our cherry sheet assessments. And we just need to watch these and be mindful that they will fluctuate from year to year. The big ones that we are always watching is the retired health insurance. For teacher, the retired teacher's health insurance, they go to the GIC. I was at a conference last week and the GIC is looking at probably a 10% increase in fiscal 26. So these numbers are continuing to grow. Um, again, school choice and, and charter, charter school, those are ones that we watch too. And as I mentioned earlier, the education is both BPS and Upper Cape Tech. And here you can see the history of our assessments for Upper Cape Tech. We had a, and in fiscal 25, we will see, or we did see a little bit of a um, jump in enrollment.
And a couple of highlights about debt service for fiscal 24. We expended $6,671,709, or just under 9% of the general fund operating budget. Debt service consists of 59% exempt debt, the excluded piece, and non-exempt debt of 37%, and funded debt of 4%. That would be CPA fund projects and a small piece for a septic loan. Non-exempt general debt totaled $2,513,167, or 3.23% of the general fund operating debt. We had no permanent borrowing during fiscal 24. Well, in the, ter in the terms of bonds, we didn't, we didn't bond anything. Um, Short-term notes, we'll, we'll continue to review them as we move forward because we haven't really ha been at the opportunity to <clears throat> roll them into long-term notes yet. We've been paying them down as we go. So in fiscal 24, $900,000 in band pay downs was made. We also added in fiscal 24, a tax exempt lease payment and that related directly to our ESCO project and the general fund subsidy of the Buzzards Bay Wastewater Treatment Facility, that debt became permanent in fiscal 24. Again, we are monitoring the, the debt situation and we are util, utilizing capital stabilization fund to finance some of this, to take some of the pressure off of the budget. But this is something that we need to start building back into the budget because as debt's falling off, we're starting to lose investment capacity. You'll hear me say that a lot tonight. <laughs> Short-term debt. At the end of fiscal 24 was $4,288,748. Again, the, we're starting to pay this down. And long-term debt total $45,906,588. That does include the clean water trust monies that I talked about for Buzzard Bay Water Treatment Facility and the TELP. They don't really add to our debt limit, but I do like to show them there because they're a liability. Our debt limit is 5% of equalized valuation. That's the total that we could borrow. The fiscal 24 EQV was $6.6 .6 billion and 5% of that is 332 million. So we are well within our limits. Okay. Yes. On the prior slide, you, you had the number for the, uh, that might have been one, for, like that, go forward one. <laughs> With the teachers that, for uh, health retired teachers of the entire. So my question is, do we have a corresponding figure for all public employees on retired um, health insurance? I, I mean, that's, yeah. say it's OPEB and it's in our oh. it's in our general budget and the shared cost. Okay, so that falls under the OPEB. OPEB. Yes. Okay. So anyone that retired from the county. Pension plan that stayed on our insurance, you'll see that's in our shared costs. And this one is different because this is on the cherry sheet. So what you see on this slide are are what comes, what's on our cherry sheet. The other retiree pension liability is part of that shared cost piece of the pie. I was just wondering where it was in the budget. Yes. It's definitely there. <laughs> so we have a little bit more control over that one. Okay. And I'm going to touch upon financial policy compliance as well. So three of our major financial policies involve free cash, the stabilization fund, and the OPEB trust fund. These are actually, sorry to interrupt, but so remember, we're looking back to FY24. So we, these... What Eric is talking about now are the prior set of policies, the 2018 version of the policies. So some of these we'll talk about how they're changing when we're building 26, but these are these are under the older version of the policies. Mm -hmm. Based on the older version of the policies, um, free cash is to have a certified free cash balance of at least 5% of the current fiscal year general fund operating budget at the beginning and during the fiscal year. So our free cash at July 1st, 2024 was $11,094,797, 14% of the general fund operating budget within policy. 
meeting policy. Stabilization fund, this is our, um, our rainy day fund, if you will. We're building up reserves here. Our policy is to maintain 6% of the general fund operating budget here. At the end of the year, we were at $5,071,802 or 6.5%. And that was the market value at June 30th. The OPEP trust fund is to maintain an OPEP trust fund to accumulate funds for other post-employment benefits. And we are currently meeting policy with the contributions that were made during the year. Let's talk about free cash one more time in case Anybody's wondering, and you all know, it's not cash and it's not free. <laughs> it's it's the remaining unrestricted funds from operations of the previous fiscal year, including unexpended free cash, previous year's actual receipts in excess of revenue estimates and unspent amounts in the budgeted line items. So we've seen a a trend upwards in free cash in recent years. And free cash is what we used on a lot of our capital investment program. So for those um, capital projects that don't make sense for borrowing, you know, things like police cruisers, um, where we don't want to borrow long-term for something that we're not going to have, and use in five or six years. Um, free cash is important because that's what allows us to keep keep moving forward on the capital needs of the town. And free cash should only be used for one-time costs. It should not be used to supplement the budget. And this just kind of visually shows you where we are in relation to policy. So the orange line is 5% of the general fund operating budget, and you'll see the certified free cash and the percent over, over policy. As I mentioned earlier, our general stabilization fund is, is a reserve for you know rainy day type items, and it's meeting policy at 6.5% of the general fund operating budget. Since the funds have been managed by our investment group, they have returned more than 2.4%. We talked about the OPEB trust fund, and this just gives you an idea of um, how significant contributions we have made in the last five years here. You see in 2019, the balance at the end of the year was $2.5 million. We have now $10.2 million in OPEP reserves. That's a, that's a lot of work. That's a huge difference. And you'll be happy to know that we have these funds invested with Rockland Trust IMG, and they are um, growing greater than the state retiree insurance trust fund. So that's good, approximately. 5.58 in the print was 4.56 in the recent year. So they're doing really well. We have um, a, a target of where we want to be for the um, percentage of total OEPB liability. So currently, our notice that when you wrote it down before, there was no target. So we're hoping to fund the liability in full. By 2046, that's what our that's our best in schedules go out to. the The idea is that once the pension obligation has been fully funded, we can kind of switch hats and start funding the OPEP liability. It's, I think it's really important to note that if you look at the end of 2020 in the column that says net OPEP liability, at that time our net OPEB liability was $133 million. And as we have put in money, that money that we put in builds the fund and creates a more investable asset so that the net liability, when you consider over the 30 years of this, this is that liability is over 30 years. So as we build the fund, 
the net liability is down to 57 million after 2023 and be even better, I think, after 2024. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we made significant progress. I just want to touch on a couple other funds within the town. We have our health insurance trust fund and the self-insurance claims trust. That's the 75% related to the town. Employee insurance withholding is the 25%. As you can see, their balances are quite healthy at 7.2 and 2.7 million at year end. We just talked about the OPEB trust fund. We talked about stabilization. We do have a couple special purpose stabilization funds, one being the capital stabilization fund at the end of 24, that balance was $3.5 million. And you'll see the amounts coming out. That's what we're using to help offset the, the debt cost and the budget, the $1.1 million. And there's a small, I wouldn't say small, but $570,000 for future solid waste stabilization and the climate stabilization in the amount of $107,000. In fiscal 24, I also wanted to note that the Special Education Reserve Fund had a balance of $387,000. Again, that's available for unexpected, unanticipated special education costs. A couple other receipts that help fund the budget uh, is the Waterways Fund. And you'll see that the balance as of June 30th was $921,996. The Ambulance Maintenance Fund had just over $3 million at the end of fiscal 24 and the conservation receipts reserve fund at $60,000. Can I ask you a question about this? So I know for the ambulance fund, the 3,026,781 doesn't include anything we're spending from that fund for the budget, right? Like we're still spending about 900,000 from that fund to cover the budget, is that right? 1.5 million. Yeah, that's what we're using in the budget. So, but that's not, that hasn't been deducted from that number yet. It's still 25. It's free cash. So free cash, when we spend in a town meeting, it's deducted from free cash. But in this one, it's not. So it'll show at 7-1. We will have receipts that come in because we've got, what's our revenues were 2.2 million. So yep. yep. So the revenues are outpacing what, what we're using to fund the budget. Does that include personnel? What we use to fund the budget, yes. Yes. In fiscal 24, we also utilize various grants to um, carry out various services. So it's always good to leverage other people's money. So um, we had the Green Communities Grant of $42,000, State 911, that's, that's usually pretty consistent, $140,000. We're still spending down, I'm looking at the big ones, we're still spending down our opera balance, $404,000 was expended in 24. Circuit Breaker spent $700,000. Special Education Cluster, $301,000. Um, we get our federal military aid, two hundred and just under $263,000. Our foundation reserve that comes from the state budget, just over seven hundred eighty thousand. So there are other avenues um, that we can uh, apply for to provide services. So again, and then there's the SR two that's in there as well. And the state military aid is a seven hundred eighty one. You can't see the number there because it's well, but that's a big number that we get from the state. Mm -hmm or um, that's been sort of codified in the budget. So. Mm -hmm. I'll just touch briefly on enterprise funds. An enterprise fund is authorized by Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 53, F and a half. And it's a separate accounting and financial reporting mechanism for municipal services for which a fee is charged in exchange for goods or services. We operate two enterprise funds trash disposal, the Integrated Solid Waste Management Department, or ISWIM, and sewer. The important things about our enterprise funds is they're self-supporting, and the general fund does not subsidize them at all. ISWIM, ISWIM retained earnings increased 
11 million increase from 11 million 169,107 dollars to 13,437,969 in fiscal 24 an increase of 20% total fund equities inclusive of that increase 29 million 944,088 dollars to 33,513,109 dollars and that includes reserves for various purposes like capital articles and post closure, et cetera. The sewer retained earnings decreased slightly in fiscal 24 um, by 2.2% or $22,410. And here is a snapshot of the ISWIM budget versus actual. As you can see, we budgeted revenues of $13,794. $794,731. Um, and they actually collected $18,984,129, 37.6% over the projections. I swim it is a unique business model. Um, <laughs> it's not dependent on rate payers like the sewer enterprise fund. So it, it it's, I hate to say profitable, um, and we have seen collections like this year over year. And here are their appropriations and expenditures. And what you'll see here is um, non-salary expense. Non-salary expenses are significant for them to operate. They're um, over there, you know, maintain operations with leachate removal, C and D, et cetera. And you'll see $600,000 for the reserve fund, the host community fee, which we increased to 1,030,000. That money is transferred over to the town's general fund. And then indirect costs, those are costs that are paid for by the general fund and ISWIM reimburses us. So that comes over to the town as a revenue source as well. Um, Erica, um, um, oh, that was a new one, reserve fund. I was thinking of the, um... Excess, you know, host community. Mm -hmm. And here are our sewer revenues. They came in over target two. Um, we budgeted $1,858,968. They came in at $2,084,009. $225,041 over budget or 12.11%. Most of that was due to an increase in the overage rates for users. We also utilized $150,000 of retained earnings to supplement the budget. And similar to ISWIM, you'll see there is a cost, an indirect cost. Again, these are costs that are expended in the general fund and turned over and reimbursed to the general fund from the sewer enterprise fund. So, in conclusion, I think overall the town leaves fiscal 24 in a favorable financial position and it's sustainable based on current services provided. We're compliant with our financial policies and industry standards in DOR certifications, financial statements, audits have um, yielded unqualified opinions, and our bond rating has remained stable. Budgeted appropriations are well managed as requested, and local receipts are conservatively budgeted and contributing to the increase in available free cash. As we move forward into future years, we should be mindful of the current economic state and be proactive, not reactive, with budgeting strategies. And as always, we will continue to explore and implement strategies to strengthen our position, including a bond rating upgrade and implementation of the town's updated policies, which will be effective for fiscal 26. Oh. And that is fiscal 24. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Do you have any other questions in relation to fiscal 24?
now we're going to switch gears a little bit to long-term planning into future years. So the annual budget should begin with a joint meeting between a select board finance committee and school committee to review revenue projections and reach consensus on overall expenditure levels, use of reserves and allocation of resources generally. Tonight, we're gonna focus on the revenue projections. So what is, what is long-term financial planning? For the GFOA, long-term financial planning combines financial forecasting and strategizing, and it's a highly collaborative process that considers future scenarios and helps governments navigate challenges. It works best as an overall strategic plan. Financial planning uses forecasts to provide insight into the future, um, financial capacity so that strategies can be developed to achieve our long-term goals and sustainability. A long-term financial planning model should include a few things. It should have past financial activity, current financial activity, and future financial activity. This is gonna help us identify, identify the town's adherence with fiscal policies, identify revenue and cost trends, and based on these trends, we can plan and evaluate future sources and uses. As Marlene had mentioned earlier, the Department of Local Services have developed an Excel workbook in 24 that we're gonna start using as a forecasting tool. And I will say, um, Erica's slides, both of these slide presentations will be on the town meeting website, the spring, the annual town meeting website. And so, uh, especially this one, there, there's going to be a lot of dense spreadsheets. We're just showing those so you can see what the tool looks like. We're not necessarily ex ex be going to be able to get into the details of those, but we will post these in case you want to refer back to them. So here's what the tax, tax levy looks like. Again, the tax levy is the amount a community raises through the property tax. The levy can be any amount up to the levy limit in accordance with Prop two and a half, and the limits the amount, and it limits the amount of tax revenues that can be raised. So as we talked about earlier, you start with the prior tax levy limit, you amend any prior year growth. That's that's usually not something we have to worry about. Add two and a half percent, add the new growth, and that gives you your levy limit. And then you add any current year exclusions. And in our case, we have other adjustments. That would be the um, assessments for the county tax and the environmental protection tax fund. And that's how we get to our levy. So I think the major takeaway here is if you look at the year to year percentage change at the bottom of the first block, you'll see that it's increasing at a rate of 2.5%. 6% in fiscal 25, 2.2, 2.4, 2.6. So we have to remind ourselves this is our biggest our biggest source of revenue. And it's likely that expenditures will outpace this growth. And then below it talks you um <clears throat> This is a tool that they use. How did you determine new growth at 275,000? What's, what's our average new growth? It's more like three, isn't it? Yeah, so that's an estimate that we've been using year over year. So that could probably use some adjustment. That was a call to level fund it going into the future years for uncertainty. So clear, just based on what we did mm -hmm. in 25. And 25. Um, are the other, the earlier years, this is like, we used to use something more similar to this, where you have history, which I really like, yeah, well, the new, not just the future. So mm -hmm. are the one, the years that are, the old years, the actuals? Yes, they are. This, the and this, years, which are the projections. And I'm still working on, this is a huge workbook, and I'm still working on updating some of these tabs. So we'll, we'll clarify that info as we move forward. And, and I think it's important because this, when you look at the numbers, the actual numbers that have been for new growth, five or 600, we have to be really careful about not using that as your projection number right. because 
you can get a year like 2008 or 2009 and you mm -hmm. have, and then you have, you don't have enough money. So mm -hmm. you're talking about like, what's our five-year average for new growth is sometimes good. So that'll, as long as we have had some bad years in there. As long as you've had some bad years in there, because, because it can give you, it is, it is a tool and the outer years are, are projections based on what on our assumptions. So if our assumptions are overly rosy, you know, then we don't want to we don't want to be forecasting something that we then don't hit, and we have to cut mid year. Mm -hmm. And then you look at like if you look at the new growth in fiscal 23, that came in way over target at 922,000, but that was directly related to personal property valuations on like the gas lines and the power lines. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a one-off year. So we just have to make sure we adjust for those things as we project out. But as I build this up some more, one thing that's really nice about this workbook, it's gonna show you exactly where all this information comes from. It's gonna say, you can go to the tax rate recap, and this is exactly which line this comes from. So it provides kind of a playbook for everyone to see it, where the information is derived. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about the tax levy? Okay. And then here is state aid. <sighs> I mean, this one's this one's kind of difficult to project. <laughs> Chapter 70. So in this case, I did use the assumption that based on the um for future years, based on the three-year average, which was 1.7% increase. So that's what you'll see going out into future years. The other projections I also based on a three-year average, which was 2%. And I assume the same for state owned land at 2%. But again, when you look at the, at the that's a year-to-date percentage change, you're not seeing a, a whole lot of growth. You're seeing one and a half percent mostly going into future years. And we level funded the other things that are really reimbursement-based or um, enrollment-based. Definitely a wild card. And then these are the local receipt projections. And again, um, conservati conservatively underestimate. And I used a 1% rate of growth for all receipts. A line got cut off at the bottom, but another thing that we also, they also recommend we need to be mindful of is in the, the current year budget, shouldn't really exceed 90% of the prior year actuals. So if I look at fiscal 22, the budget was 98.3% of the prior year actual. So we were, we were really, we were really close <laughs> right there. We were right there. Well, we were, yeah. Um, fiscal 23, 24 and 25, they have more around 75% of the prior year actual. So we do have a little bit of, a little bit of safety there. Those actuals too, Erica? Yes. So anything, so 21 through 24 are actuals. I, just, I, just, yeah, I know it says budget. Really very similar going across. Mm -hmm. That I'm still working on that tab of the workbook, but again, um, we are seeing non-exempt debt decreasing as we move into future years in and what's happening is, is as that decreases, other costs are rising and that's being absorbed into the budget and we're losing that investment capacity. So one thing that our new financial policy does, and we were very clear that we would need to build it up over time because it's not, um, we it's can't a do big it. It's a big change. It is a big change. Is that we earmark 5% of our general fund operating budget for capital or for debt in the budget. And that number is $3.9 million. And we're at 1.3 million. So. We don't have to do it for debt though, Ken. We can actually operationally well, spend mon money. For well, there's also 2% for the pay as you go stuff. So operationally they're looking at 7%. But yeah, I mean, I guess if you wanted to pay for something within the operating budget, but you wouldn't put that in the operating budget.
And then this combines those three revenue categories. And again, you'll see the, the trend here is that revenues based on these assumptions are increasing around 2% going into future years. So just modest increase expect, expected. And we are gonna see expenditures outpacing the revenue growth. Okay, I make a comment here. Yeah. yeah. So one of the problems that I've seen in the past with this, and it, it, it's trapped us, I'm gonna say trapped us, but when when we've every the couple of times when we've gone for overrides, we looked at this kind of thing and we pro, we projected these, you know, out in five years we're gonna be in a big deficit. But the, the problem is that this is not reliable beyond two or three years. Not at all. Because, because you're going to have your turn backs. You're going to have your additional revenues. And if it, it, over, the, over five years, it builds up too much. Mm -hmm. So it's cautionary because if you really look historically, our revenues have increased you know, 3.3, 3.2, 4. Our revenues are increasing more than they're showing in the projections. And so that it that becomes a cumulative thing. I think it's very worthwhile to look at it, but I get really, I'm very cautious about looking more than two or three years mm -hmm. out because it's it's just not going to be accurate and it's going to look worse than it is. It, it is going to look worse than it is. It, it's a tool and it's definitely a tool. I think I think as we continue to look, get more and more years loaded in, the tool will become better because we will have a longer, you know, a longer history built into it to kind of but think but you know, the past few, like what we're showing here, the past few years have been good years. So we're not, we haven't captured yet the the tough years. So um, you're, you're right. It is, it is not, it's certainly not a crystal ball and we're not saying at all that this is what it's going to be. But I think that if we can, Keep in keep the long term perspective in mind as as and this is just the revenue side. So if we look at the revenue side and the expense side, so it's yeah, to be a whole different picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Again, just some major takeaways from these conversations: is revenue growth is limited due to Prop Two and a Half. State is not expected to increase significantly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, local receipts will fluctuate with the health of the economy, and we really don't want to target more than 90% of the prior year actuals. Um, that targets need to be built back in. Revenue growth is expected to be around 2% based on these projections. And we're seeing expenditure growth outpacing revenue growth in certain areas like OPEB, pension, utilities, health insurance. We saw a lot of a, a huge change in enrollment. So mm -hmm. that's something we're going to talk about. So let me tell you a little bit where um, you are for FY26. So the operating budgets were just due um, the week before last, and we've started sitting down with all the departments. We met yesterday, today, and we're meeting tomorrow. Um, and capital requests were due last week, and I believe I do have them all in. So what I will say is that um, we are definitely, at least from the from the requests that we're getting in, People are at a point where they feel like they need to they need to to keep up with the demand for services that they're feeling they need more. Um, on the capital side, 
we will not be able to fund everything. So when we sit down with capital outlay, we are going to have to, we're going to have to trim and we're going to have to say what makes the most sense kind of community wide to defer to a future year or, or kind of cut back and scale down. So um, we, we're we're kind of looking at how the puzzle can fit together. We're looking at all of the funding sources. Um, we are there's going to be a whole range of excluded debt if uh, if a fire station moves moves forward. There's going to be all sorts of non-exempt debt to build that borrowing that investment capacity back into the budget. There's going to be a heavy use of free cash, so it's all, it's all on the table. But the um, requests, the funding requests, are, have are definitely outstripping the the resources for this year. Um, and on the operating side, we're seeing you know we've seen departments who have de delayed and deferred and wait you know we're pushing things off and pushing things off and. Um, we are probably going to have to look at a couple of staffing positions for in building inspectors, for um, um, EMS officers. So there are a few key positions that we, we might have to talk about adding to the budget. Um, but all of, and kind of, Adding to the uncertainty is all of the collective bargaining contracts are open. So we don't have settled contracts with anyone, any of the groups for FY26. So we are definitely working in a very uncertain environment. And for that reason, um, you know, clearly my responsibility is to provide a balanced budget to the select board no later than January 15th um, by the charter. I am going to take some time to see how pieces fall. We're expecting, uh, we're, we could be, well, we're anticipating, let me put it that way. We're anticipating a significant increase for Barnesville County retirement. Um, so we we need to wait and get some of that information before we can really sit down and put the pieces together. But I can say that this year, more than the past couple of years, the departments are saying we need to provide we need to provide these services, and this is what we need to do it. Yes. Now, town administrator said that all the collecting bargaining is all, and that's on the non-school side. For the school side, is that the same assumption? And what assurances do we have that we're not going to be like some of these three South North Shore communities right now, as far as negotiation and not going well and teachers are striking? Because I'm being asked that now around town is, I mean, how, how stable are we with our various collective units? So through both chairs, I got the head nod. Um, we have uh, tentative agreements with two of our four, three of our four unions, and we're going into negotiations with teachers two weeks from now. So we've worked really well with um, with our partners of, of the union leadership. We we're knocking on wood, but we think that we're in, in a good place to settle uh, before, hopefully before the holidays. Definitely before our budget is is um, is voted. If history says anything, there's has there ever been a time where teachers have taken that route? Never. Never say never, but I'm just asking the question. Just, I think there's a good relationship that you know is happening, and yeah. if there's no surprises, I think there's a lot of communication that goes on between the union and the administration to to not be in that type of position, mm -hmm. and the understanding that you know there's not an endless bit of <laughs> money, I think, I think both schools are, you know, I think that um, they understand fiscal responsibility. We're entering into our contract negotiations December 9th, so we start as well, so we're in the same mm -hmm. same seat. 
<laughs> so that's where things stand as of now. A lot more is to be determined and figured out. We'll have a lot of conversations as numbers come in. So what would what would um what would this what would be helpful for this group going forward in order to kind of help get us to a position where we can agree on a budget that that we can do for you? I, don't, I, mean, I think this is a difficult I mean, this is a difficult year and I think it's me because I always do um I think you know sometimes you can go into January and you can have a pretty solid idea I'm I'm I don't know if that's going to be the case this year and I kind of I kind of think back to Around 2015, I want to say we were in a crunch. You know, we were trying to avoid an override, and we kind of worked. We looked at the budget; it wasn't balanced when we looked at it in January. And maybe our budget's not going to be balanced when we look at it in January. Maybe we're going to look at it in January and say, "Well, I, you know, me, I this, this no, this this is this is a balanced option. How about that?" <laughs> Um, when it came, as we discussed the budget, we found, we made compromises. Mm -hmm. I, I want to say in that year, we funded the reserve fund a little bit less so that we could accommodate something in the school budget that they felt was really important. And I think it's going to, this is going to be a year for conversations and Maybe we have a balanced budget and you say these were all the things that we couldn't do hmm. or these are the differences where we are. And then we spend those those period of time talking as a community about what's important and how we're going to fund it and how we're going to make it work for the community. So. so I do think that there will be some big discussions about things that could that could possibly look different for FY26. One is not funding OPEB in the budget. I think we need to talk about that flexibility of the option of, of not having OPEB funded through the operating budget. We, we will still fund it. Um, and I think that with the site assignment extension for iSwim, I think there is less pressure for, you know, the threat of iSwim closing in the, you know, in the kind of in our projection time frame that, and I, that we might want to consider looking at the host community fee offset, not, you know, not it, not increasing it to a level where then I swim feels pressure because they could have a bad year. So not increasing it to a point of to a dangerous point where I swim wouldn't hit the mark, but possibly increasing it over the 600,000 that we're using right now, because, you know, it, when you do look back on the historical side, that is that is one of the areas that historically is con always considerably, I shouldn't say always, but over the over the, you know, the recent history has been considerably higher than we're than we're planning for. And, and there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. So when we set the host community fee at six hundred thousand. It was based on a per ton that was much lower mm -hmm. than what it is now. And so we actually had to increase their budget so they'd be able to pay for what we think is going to happen. So um, when we started the 600000 I want to say there was maybe 189000 of excess host community fee. And now we're up to about 400000 mm -hmm. So. I really think that is an area for adjusting to find something that's um, to, 
to, you know, go back and look at how many tons was 600,000, how many tons, and, or like, what are we ba like ba balancing our planning it for, have a rationale for it, but using, we should be using more of it for the operating because it's too much is going into capital stabilization. But. And I guess to add even more uncertainty to all of our open labor contracts, our long-term contract with Covanta is also open. So that is something that will also change those rates. That is underway. Have you, um, I think when we left here last year, we said we were going to try to target like 3% budget increases. Do you have a number for that now or do you not? No. There's at this point, there's just too much unknown. Okay. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to set that number prematurely because it, it can change, it could change significantly, I think. And I don't want to, I don't want to have to, I don't want to have to go, I don't want to have to go back and have, have to redo, have anybody have to redo it. So I think this budget more than last year we have to wait. We have to take a more wait and see tact. Mm -hmm. yeah, these are wish wish may need to be need to be less than because the money is there. Yeah. If I'm are we talking more deferred maintenance on 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 actual buildings? Are we talking material things that would have to be deferred? Um both. It, it could be, I mean, there, there's there's certainly requests for both. So depending on how the conversations go, um, there are there are new things that the department feel. And so let me let me tell you what I plan, at least right now, I plan to approach this in putting showing you, showing the boards and committees all of the requests. So here's here's what the departments are saying they need, and here's why they're saying they're needing needing it. And then here's my recommendation on what we can do this year. So I don't plan on I don't plan on taking anything off the list before we get to capital outlay. I'll lay it all out there and I'll say, okay, the free cash requests are are 3.2 million. We have you know, about 2 million to spend. So it, how are we going to trim 1.2 million? But I'll lay all the requests out there so we can have the conversation about, you know, what what do you collectively as a community feels most, most appropriate to scale back on? One, one of the things that we've been looking at are seeing happen the last couple of years, and it's concerning, I think, is exactly what you said, Peter, is deferring maintenance because we're getting a lot of requests for emergency funding to repair things. And, you know, those should really be factored in. Um, I'm concerned about deferring them because all of a sudden we get big numbers and you need it and we have to wait until the next town meeting because there aren't the funds there. So... I mean, me personally, I would like to take a look at those maintenance issues and stay up on maintenance so that we're not shutting down an operation at some point. One of the things about capital I think that happened is that during COVID, um, the town administration didn't want to spend any money on capital. I mean, we deferred capital the first town meeting for COVID we didn't, we, I think we did nothing. Yeah. I think in the fall, we did a little bit. And I think when you start doing that, say, oh, we, we're not going to replace this equipment, we're going to wait on this equipment, that you get into those situations. And I think it's going to be helpful for us to see, <clears throat> based on the discussion of consistent debt service, mm -hmm. which was a policy that we had in place for a long time under a previous financial director said, I want to keep it at 5% so that I know it's always there when we need it. Because if you start spending that money on something else, then when you need to spend 5%, you don't have it. What is the borrowing? I mean, if 
what is our borrowing pattern if we were going to do, you know have that what what would it look like and how would it affect the budget so i think there's a lot of creative things that you all are going to have to come back with us for in january <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, what I will say is there is also a limit to the capacity for us to be able to manage the projects. So even if we do like, magically have the five, which we don't, we don't have the 5%, but even if we magically, the 5% appeared, we have to be careful that we're not, you know, rushing the projects out the door and they're not done well. Because that's that's not that's not being good stewards of your money either. So it is a balance, you know. We don't want to we don't want to just rush rush through the work to spend the money. We we want to do, and sometimes it takes. I mean, sometimes it takes time. A lot more time than than we think it'll take. I also think that working more in terms of a realistic five-year plan helps mm -hmm. with that because the five-year plan should be helping you plan out how you're going to spend your time and your resources yep. and your being able to get things done. Because if you think about it, we've already got an ISOM building that we're working on. And although it's a lot of ISOM staff, you know, how many major buildings can you do in, in, right at once? At one time. I mean, yeah. there's a there's a limit. And so I, I definitely see yeah. there is a limit. And we also have an obligation to we have we have articles that we haven't been able to get to yet. So we have an obligation to to do that bef I feel before we ask for more and just sit on it. That, I don't want to do that either. So, so I think we can, we need to show you kind of what we need to show you the needs. And then we need to talk about here in the universe of all the needs, here's what we can actually get done in a year. And here's what we can actually afford in a year. And, and then, and then it's the conversation at the committee levels of, okay, if this is how much they can commit to, and this is how much we can afford, which of these is the most important to do right now? When you give this um, description of the needs, will it be prioritized by how long some of these needs have been going on for? So for example, there could be something that's a new need and something that's been needed for several years that there hasn't been money for for several years. So. For capital, um, at least on the town side, I rely on the departments to, to in their capital presentations to you, I rely on them to say, we've requested this. You know, this has been on the capital, this has been on our capital plan, and it has, we've asked for it the past four years, and it hasn't been funded. So that's, um, I, at least on on the town side departments, there's not a lot of those where it the same project has reliably shown up on every single CIP and it was it was a no. But that's why the that's why having a realistic five year plan is important so we can see which are the projects that are always getting put off. So on a budgeting side. Um, if you're not ready to give the departments a percentage increase, how do they go about putting together their budget if they don't know how much they can increase by? So are we doing like scenario one if we have this, scenario two if we have this? So the budgets that I'm receiving from the town departments are the, the instructions were level service. So... Um, if if there are any new initiative requests, those are not built into the budget. They're they're separate and they're on the side, and and the analysis is for us to maintain all of our current assets and our current services. This is what we're requesting. So th those are those are the budgets that I receive. And then if they want to say, okay, I want to 
I really, here's my level of service budget, but I really need this other person and it's, you know, $95,000 or it's $72,000. Those kind of stay on the side until we see how, you know, how all of the pieces fit together. <clears throat> Uh, will we will we get the five year budgets for every department prior to the December second meeting? Yes, I plan on sending the book out uh, right before Thanksgiving. So, um, and we, I will have, I will have the. I'm I'm just trying to think what's in the folder. Every department that has submitted capital requests, I believe has given a five year lookout. So we'll have we'll have the five year CIP and then we'll have this year's requests. Thank you. Just want to mention for those of you who don't know it that um the select board and prior to select board sewer commissioners have been working on our comprehensive wastewater management plan that we need to do um, to address the nitrogen sensitive in the new Title V. That plan is being, our draft plan is being submitted to me by December 16th. There will be a 30 day comment period, which they will be reviewing. The select board is going to be, I think having some sort of presentation or summary meeting on January 7th of 2025 to talk, talk about it. The numbers in that plan are pretty frightening. And so just to know that the there are some major capital things that the, the town and the people of the town are facing, because a lot of our plan is to rely on individual homeowners, because we heard tonight, to upgrade their system. And that is not inexpensive, and it is a burden. So. That plan is probably coming to this annual town meeting too. So um, some of the other towns, Mashpee and Sandwich included, actually instituted a surcharge similar to CPA to help fund wastewater infrastructure. And so that may be a discussion that we as a town have to have as well. Um, and they did it by reducing their CPA and then adding, putting some of it into the wastewater infrastructure fund. So, um, and I did meet with the capital and budget facilities of the schools to let them know that um, part of our plan is the consideration of expanding the wastewater treatment plant at the middle school to allow us to sewer a portion of Fiddy's Harbor, which was um, a nitrogen sensitive area. So we're gonna see if people like that plan <laughs> and it works. <laughs> Good. Other comments or questions? Thank everyone for coming. I think um, having a picture of the whole town, and I think if we work together in our setting of priorities and figuring out the budget, we'll have another successful budget passing at town meeting. So, you know, that's good. Yes. So you are, you were just submitting a motion to adjourn. And a motion to adjourn this meeting. Second. Roll call vote to adjourn, Harry. Yes. Donna. Yes. Evelyn. Yes. Maureen. Yes. Yes. Okay. School committee meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 Roll call vote. Amanda. Yes. Yes. Tom? Yes. Wayne? Yes. Priscilla? Yes. Dan? Yes. And I would say yes. Give me the charge. Thank you. Yes. 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Um, no, if you ever need a, a hand yeah, right. yeah, right. I'm happy to do whatever. Thank you. Thank you. I think I think it's all the way to the top of the line. I was thrown at us. Right. Some of those acronyms are like with DOR. That must be part of the revenue. We have to continue our meeting. Excuse me. We have to continue our meeting. Could you continue your Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, we would like to have a switch on also. Super. We this committee needs to let it go. All right. Uh, minutes of 1025. Okay. Yeah. Second. Motion by Peter, second by Anne Marie to approve. Yeah. Oh, no. 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 During discussion, seeing none, roll call vote, Jean. Yes. Melissa? Yes. Henry? Yes. Kunti? Yes. Unanimous 500. Committee reports. Committee reports. I was going to report on the meeting with the, with the capital out, but the budget committee, but I already did that, so I don't need to do it. Um, correspondence. Um, so in our correspondence, we did have a letter from the Madero says, um, and they're asking the board to consider their request about the CMP, CWMP. I don't know if the board wants to have that discussion as part of our January 7th meeting, or if you feel you know, it would be productive to have a separate agenda item or just have it as part of that January 7th meeting. I think I, 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 I confused myself. Yeah. So. I think January 7th is reasonable. Could it be, yeah, be all the same say. subject? I mean, I think it's all the same subject. And, and I think, I mean, I understand that they have concerns, but I don't think that we're prepared to do an NOI. So, um, and, but I will say that I did um, contact um, um, and forward that correspondence to Bob Collette, who's the chair of the Board of Health, because um, I think a lot of this has to do with the Board of Health. Whether we do an NOI or not doesn't mean that they're going to, we don't know what, <laughs> how they would vote. So, Mm -hmm. They do sometimes give waivers and they don't. So we'll we'll put that on the agenda for January 7th as part of the CWMP discussion. Okay. So select board's correspondence, November 19th, 2024. A, DEP letter, J2 range Eastern environmental monitoring report. B, NSTAR petition seeking approval of a three-year energy efficiency plan. C, email from Jamie Darris regarding nitrogen-sensitive air zones, born filing NOI. D, Travelers Club Historic Places nomination. E, DEP letter, 2023 annual land use control letter report. And F, a butter's notice for Six Lake Drive septic upgrade. And that's it. Um, next meeting, I just want to add to the next meeting dates. I believe we have a December 2nd marijuana workshop at 4.30. Yes, you do now. Okay. And got it. Is that a three o'clock? I won't be there. I think it was four or four thirty. Four thirty. Right. Yeah. But that was motion by Peter, who was the second. I was. Uh, this is a motion to adjourn. Uh, Jean, yes. Melissa, yes. Yeah. Amory, yes. Peter, yes. Yes. Five zero zero. Thank you very much. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.